Hello, my wonderful students. Today, you're going to learn English through stories. We're going to review four different short stories. And these stories are going to progress from more beginner to more advanced. Welcome back to J4S English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First, I'll read the headline, Fred the pig caught after mischief rampage. So in this picture, it looks like this is Fred the pig. And he was caught after mischief rampage. First, I want you to notice my pronunciation here. Mischief, jiff, jiff, mischief. So here you don't hear this E sound because we do have a word that you may be familiar with, which is chief, chief. Same spelling at this end, but this here is a long E sound, eef chief, but here you don't hear that long E and it's just like if you were saying if, mischief, mischief. So notice that pronunciation. And what exactly is mischief? Mischief essentially means bad behavior, bad behavior. We use this a lot with children, of course. The children got into mischief while I was working. Now let's talk about rampage, rampage. What is this? This is, okay. This is when you go through an area and you do that making a lot of noise and causing damage. So this pig went through an area and as he was going around, he was either making noise or causing damage or doing both of those at the same time. That would describe a rampage, a mischief rampage. Now notice the sentence structure. Fred the pig caught after mischief rampage. Now, what do you notice about this part of the sentence? Is this an active sentence or a passive sentence? It might be difficult for you to identify this because in headlines of newspaper articles or short stories, they often omit certain words that are only there grammatically. So in this case, to identify the passive, you would normally see the verb to be because that's the correct grammatical structure. Now, correct grammar would be Fred the pig was caught after mischief rampage, but native speakers understand the sentence structure without the auxiliary verb and headlines and short story titles always try to be as short as possible. And they do that by omitting these words that are there for grammar, but not essential to understand the meaning, but the sentence structure, if you were writing this in any other context, you would need was caught, the past simple of the verb to be. Now that's our passive sentence. If you wanted to turn this into an active sentence, what could you say? Hmm, think about that. Fred the pig was caught. Well, we don't know who caught Fred the pig, but we could just say, people, <laughs> because I don't know who the subject is, people or maybe officials caught Fred the pig. Now this is our active sentence because the subject is doing the action where in this case, Fred the pig is receiving the action. So this is our active sentence and this is our passive sentence. I wrote that there for you and don't worry about writing all these notes down because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. So you can look in the description for the link. Now let's continue and learn about Fred's mischief rampage. After numerous complaints, numerous is another way of saying many after numerous complaints, after many complaints. And a complaint is when you see something negative. So if you went to a restaurant and you didn't like the food and then you told the, the server, the waiter, this isn't very good, you are making a complaint. 
making a complaint. So that's the verb that goes with the noun complaint. I made a complaint about the food. Now, complain is the verb form. And this, a complaint, that's a noun. As a noun, notice it has an article. In our sentence here, after numerous complaints, there's no article because you don't use an article when it's a plural noun. But if you were to use the verb form, I complained about the food. So when you dislike something or you have a negative experience and you make that known to someone, you are making a complaint or you are complaining, the noun form or the verb form. After numerous complaints of mischief, we know what this means and the pronunciation. Remember, mischief is simply bad behavior. Mischief, jif, mischief. In the city of Aurora, a 400 pound. LB, this is the short form to identify pound. A 400 pound culprit, culprit. Well, what or who is a culprit? Well, Fred the pig is the culprit. And a culprit is someone, or in this case, something, a pig, who has done something wrong. A 400 pound culprit, Fred the pig, has finally been caught loitering outside a shopping center. Now, in this case, it is still the passive voice because the culprit, who is Fred the pig, is receiving the action. And they're not, the story isn't focusing on who caught Fred the pig, which is why we don't even know who caught Fred the pig. And that's why I had to just write people or officials because that's not the purpose of the story. The purpose of the story is learning about how Fred the pig was caught. A 400 pound culprit has finally been caught loitering outside a shopping center. Let's talk about this verb to loiter. Loiter is the verb. Notice that pronunciation. Oi, oi, loi, loiter, loiter, loiter. Now, when you loiter, you stay in a public place. This could be a mall, a restaurant, a school, without an obvious reason to be there. Well, what's the obvious reason to be at a mall? To purchase something. But oftentimes, younger people and maybe older people as well will go to the mall as a form of an activity, but they have no intention of buying something. They don't even have any money, but they're in the mall and they're just staying there. So they're taking up space, maybe they're making noise, disturbing people, and they're not actually customers because they are not buying anything. So in that case, those people are loitering. And a lot of public places like malls, schools, will have a sign that says no loitering, which is telling you, unless you're here to buy something, I don't want you here and you shouldn't be here, which makes sense because you shouldn't go to a location unless you plan to buy something, right? From the mall's perspective. Personally, I also go to the mall sometimes with friends without the intent of buying something. So in that case, I am loitering. But this pig, Fred the pig, has finally been caught loitering outside a shopping center. So this looks like perhaps it's the shopping center. And obviously he has no reason to be there. So he's loitering. Fred the pig was loitering. All right, let's continue. Officials say Fred, who dodged them for several days. Let's talk about the verb dodge. This is a great verb to have in your vocabulary. When you dodge, dodge, odge, when you dodge something or someone, you avoid. You avoid that something, I'll add, or someone, because it's very common to dodge someone. 
And why do you avoid that something or someone? Usually because if you get that something or that someone, it will be unpleasant in some way. So Fred, <laughs> the pig, dodged them. So in this case, it's officials, the officials who were trying to catch him. Fred the pig dodged officials, avoided officials. Why? Because if the officials caught him, he would be in danger potentially. Of course, that's what the pig would think. Now, this is a very common word that you can use in your speech. For example, I've been dodging my boss's phone calls. So this is the exact same thing as saying I've been avoiding, avoiding my boss's phone calls. So my phone rings, I look at it, it's my boss and I press silence or decline, or I just let it ring. That's how I dodge my boss's phone calls. Why would I do that? Because if I talk to my boss, something unpleasant is going to happen. Maybe I did a bad job with the report and I know my boss is mad about the report. So if I pick up that call, he's just going to say, Jennifer, why did you do that report like that? And it's going to be unpleasant for me. So obviously I want to avoid that. I want to dodge that. Officials say Fred, who dodged them for several days, is always hungry and loves his belly scratches. So this is scratch and then his belly. I don't know if you have any pets. Do you have any pets? So notice that's how you would ask that. Do you have any pets? I'll write this for you. Do you have any pets? A very common question to ask. And to answer, you can say, I have, and then whatever your pets are. I have two cats, a dog, a bird, and a 400 pound pig, for example. Or you can simply say, no, I don't. Or you might talk about a pet you had in the past. I had a dog, but now I don't have any pets. Technically, you don't even need to say this because if you said, I had a dog because this verb is in the past. I know now you don't, but I'm just showing you if you wanted to expand on your answer. So share your answer to this question in the comments below. Do you have any pets? And this is true for me. I have two cats. I have two cats. What about you? What about you? Share that in the comments below. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. It took about eight people and five hours to capture him. Capture is another way of saying catch, capture, catch, and you can use capture specifically with animals. They now hope to find his forever home, his forever home. So in this case, forever is being used as an adjective to describe the type of home. And you see this a lot now when animal shelters are trying to, to find homes for their animals. They might have these really adorable pictures of a cat or a puppy or a pig, apparently, and say, uh, Fred is looking for his forever home, which means that they want someone to adopt Fred permanently. Notice how adopt is used with animals. You're probably familiar with the verb adopt for children. You can adopt a child if you're 
unable to have children of your own or simply because you want to, you can adopt a child, but you can also adopt a pet. And obviously when you adopt a child, it's a permanent situation. So that's why they're using this verb as well because they want you to know that when you take this dog home with you, that's a permanent situation. That dog now has his forever home. Let's continue. City officials first became aware of Fred on September 24th when they received a call about a pig that was tearing up a person's yard. All right, let's talk about the phrasal verb to tear up. In this context, tear up means cause damage to because they're talking about a person's yard. A yard is the area in front of one's house or behind one's house where there's grass, trees, flowers, that's your yard. You can have your front yard or your backyard, or you can simply say yard. So yard, grass, flowers, trees, bushes. And then if he was tearing it up, maybe he was digging a hole. He was eating the flowers. So he was causing damage to that person's yard. Now tear up can also be used with a piece of paper. Right now I'm tearing up this piece of paper. I'm taking a whole piece of paper and it's going into smaller pieces. So that's to tear up in the sense of a piece of paper. Now look at this sentence and notice my pronunciation. First notice is the exact same spelling as we just saw here for tear up a person's yard or tear up a piece of paper. But listen to the pronunciation. I teared up ear. So I wrote it out phonetically for you, ear. So that long E sound. I teared up when I watched the sad movie. I teared up. Oh, so when you tear up, you get tears in your eyes. I teared up when I watched the sad movie. I always tear up when I watch sad movies. You don't want to watch a sad movie with me because I always tear up. Okay, so notice that same exact same phrasal verb, but different pronunciation and different meanings, but the context will make it obvious. It's not possible that tears were produced in this person's yard. So it doesn't make sense that this would be tear up. So it's always the context that will make it obvious. So a pig that was tearing up, causing damage to a person's yard, the area in front of their house or behind their house with grass, trees, flowers, bushes, shrubs, a fence. But when animal officers arrived on the scene, they were not able to find him. More calls came in the next day. Notice you need the for next day, the next day. Sometimes I see students forget the, and they just say next day. More calls came in the next day, this time about a pig in traffic. So traffic, of course, with all the cars on the road in traffic. Then another call about a pig that was ruining someone's landscaping. Landscaping is what you do to a yard to make it beautiful. So landscaping is when you add flowers, a garden, trees in specific areas, some decorative rocks and other decor to make your yard beautiful. That is called landscaping. Now this pig, Fred the pig, oh, that, Fred the pig, he was ruining to ruin. Ruin is also when you cause damage to, but if you describe something as ruined, it means that the damage was permanent and you can't save it. So it's no longer useful. Uh, so permanent damage to something. So tear up to me sounds less severe. The amount of damage is about here, but ruin the amount of damage is here. 
So to cause permanent damage to something, I'll write that for you. Let's continue. He was then spotted again. When you spot something or someone, it means you identify them. You identify them by seeing that person or that something visibly. So let's say you're at a conference and there are many, many people, but then all of a sudden you spot your colleague. Oh, I spotted Joan, my colleague Joan. I spotted Joan. So you were able to identify Joan in this large area of many other people. Here's another example with spot. Can you spot the mistake in this report? So again, can you identify the mistake? Can you see it? Can you notice it? But the important part is, and I wrote it here for it, for you, it's because you're trying to. So I was trying to identify Joan in the crowd. I was trying to spot Joan. And you're reading a report carefully because you're trying to identify to spot the mistake. So you're trying to do this. It's not just things you see because they're around you. You have to be trying to identify it, to use spot. He was then spotted again three days later on September 27th. So this makes sense because they're trying to see, notice, identify Fred the pig in the early morning hours. This time, Fred was in a position where he could be captured. Captured, again, remember, we can use caught, which this article has used quite a lot as well, where he could be captured, caught, Miss Allen said. Still, it was no easy task. Notice the sentence structure here, because to make this negative, generally we don't just add no before something in English. Generally, you need an auxiliary verb. Still, it wasn't an easy task. This is the standard way to make something negative. Was not, was not an easy task. And then the contraction of was not, which native speakers very commonly use, is wasn't. It wasn't an easy task. This, to say it was no easy task, this is an alternative structure that we use mainly to emphasize the negative. So I want to make it sound stronger. If I just say, oh, it wasn't an easy task. It was no easy task. It's more forceful to emphasize that no, it wasn't an easy task. It was no easy task. So you could say maybe learning English was no easy task until I found Jennifer's videos. Learning English was no easy task until I found Jennifer's videos. And now hopefully it is an easy task, was no easy task, was not an easy thing to do. So feel free to put this in the comments if you agree that now it's easier because you have my lessons to help you. And by putting this in the comments, you're practicing this alternative sentence structure. So put that in the comments. Learning English was no easy task until I found Jennifer's videos. All right, let's continue. He, wa he just wasn't ready to give up his holiday of running around the city and eating what he wanted to eat, she said. So, of course, the he is Fred the pig. And this is talking about the fact how he didn't want to be captured, caught, and it was no easy task. Well, and remember before, the pig, Fred the pig, was dodging was dodging them, which made it no easy task to capture him. Dodge is avoid. Now, why? 
because he wasn't ready to give up his holiday. This is a useful phrasal verb to give something up. In this case, the something is his holiday. And when you give something up, you simply stop doing it. You stop doing the something or you stop using the something. So a lot of people use this when they quit smoking. Oh, I need to give up smoking. I need to stop smoking, stop doing the activity or using the activity. So in this case, stop his holiday. He wasn't ready to give up his holiday of running around the city and eating what he wanted to eat. She said, of course, he wasn't ready to give it up. After he was captured, staff affectionately gave him the name Fred. So when you do something affectionately, you do it with love, love, friendliness, uh, admiration, and affectionately, this is an adverb and it modifies the verb gave him the name. Because at the beginning, the story sounded like, oh, this pig is causing damage. This pig is ruining yards. This pig is loitering. So these negative things about the pig. But the staff feel affection towards the pig. So they affectionately gave him the name Fred to show that they're not mad at the pig. They are, they feel friendliness or love towards the pig. So the staff affectionately gave him the name Fred. And he has been staying at the Aurora Animal Shelter ever since. So because this is in the present perfect continuous verb tense, I know he, the pig is still there now. The pig, Fred the pig, is still at the Aurora Animal Shelter now. Miss Allen said he is an unusual addition to the shelter, animal shelter. This is an area where they, they care for abandoned pets or pets without homes. They call that a shelter to the shelter, which more commonly houses cats and dogs. Of course, they don't get many pigs at animal shelters in cities, of course. Staff are not sure how he ended up on the streets of Aurora. When you end up to use the phrasal verb, it talks about your, your final state or your final decision. So, He's on the streets of Aurora, but they have no idea how that became his final location. How did he get there? How did he end up there? So you can use that. This is a very common phrasal verb. For example, I might say, I ended, ended up staying home last night. This implies that my final decision or action was to stay home, but because I used ended up, it implies that I was considering other options, but I ended up staying home. So this was out of all the option options I was considering, this is my final option. I ended up staying home last night. I ended up adopting a pig <laughs> named Fred, which I don't think I'll end up doing, but I guess it's a possibility because I do love animals, but I don't think I can take Fred home for his forever home. Staff are not sure how he ended up on the streets of Aurora, how that became his final position. They have speculated that he may have been a backyard pet. Remember I explained backyard already a backyard pet that grew to be a much bigger size than expected. You're probably wondering about the verb speculate. It has the same meaning as the verb guess. When you guess an answer, for example, it means you're not 100% certain what the correct answer is, but you're just going to guess. So when you speculate, you don't know 
what the answer is, but you're just, you're guessing, you're using the information that you have to provide an explanation, but you're not 100% certain. So they're guessing that he was a backyard pet that grew to be much bigger than expected, but they're not 100% sure if this is correct. They probably got him as a little piglet. So a baby pig is called a piglet baby pig, just like a baby cat is a kitten, a baby dog is a puppy. So this is a baby pig is a piglet, a little piglet, and he just continued to grow, Miss Allen said. Nobody has claimed Fred. So this means nobody has said, Fred is my pig. If someone said, Fred is my pig, then that person claimed Fred. But unfortunately, nobody has said that. And he seems to like his new home for now, but staff are hoping to find a farm for him where he can play and be at ease. At ease, at ease, you need the preposition at. This would be another way of saying be relaxed, relaxed. If you're at ease, it means you're relaxed. There's no tension. And they're looking for a farm that can be, remember the expression we, we learned as well, that can be his forever home. His forever home. I don't know about you, but I love animal stories. I love animals. I always tear up when I hear about animals. So let's all say in the comments, good luck, Fred. Good luck, Fred. And hopefully Fred will find his forever home. So put good luck, Fred, in the comments. And that was the end of the article. So what I'll do now is I'll read the article from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. So let's do that now. Fred the pig caught after mischief rampage. After numerous complaints of mischief in the city of Aurora, a 400 pound culprit has finally been caught loitering outside a shopping center. Officials say Fred, who dodged them for several days, is always hungry and loves his belly scratches. It took about eight people and five hours to capture him. They now hope to find his forever home. City officials first became aware of Fred on September 24th when they received a call about a pig that was tearing up a person's yard. But when animal officers arrived on the scene, they were not able to find him. More calls came in the next day, this time about a pig in traffic. Then another call about a pig that was ruining someone's landscaping. He was then spotted again three days later on September 27th in the early morning hours. This time, Fred was in a position where he could be captured, Miss Allen said. Still, it was no easy task. He just wasn't ready to give up his holiday of running around the city and eating what he wanted to eat, she said. After he was captured, staff affectionately gave him the name Fred, and he has been staying at the Aurora Animal Shelter ever since. Miss Allen said he is an unusual addition to the shelter, which more commonly houses cats and dogs. Staff are not sure how he ended up on the streets of Aurora. They have speculated that he may have been a backyard pet that grew to be a much bigger size than expected. They probably got him as a little piglet and he just continued to grow, Miss Allen said. Nobody has claimed Fred yet and he seems to like his new home for now, but staff are hoping to find a farm for him where he can play and be at ease. Amazing job. Now let's make it a little more difficult. Let's review a B1 short story. Our story is called Stella the Star by Siri. Siri is the digital assistant if you use an Apple device. Now, I came across this story the other day and I thought it was so cute. It was so touching. I wanted to share it with you and you will learn lots of great vocabulary along the way. Notice I said I came across this story. When you come across something, I came across this story, you find it by chance, which means I wasn't specifically looking for 
a story that I could share with you. I was just doing something totally different and then I came across this story. Now, it's possible that you came across this video. So if this video was shown to you and you weren't planning on watching a video to help you learn English through stories, but you thought it sounded interesting, so you clicked on it, you came across this video. And I am so happy you did. And if you're happy as well and you're excited to learn this story and improve your English along the way, then put in the comments, I'm so happy I came across this video. Of course, came is the past simple of the verb to come across and you came across this video. So put it in the comments. Now let's talk about this story, Stella the star. Of course, you see many, many stars in this picture here. And notice how some of the stars are drawn into pictures, a picture of a boat. Do you know what this is called? It's called a constellation, which is a group of stars. And generally we try to form an image of them and we have a name for them, like the Big Dipper you may be familiar with. We call that a constellation. And do you notice that Stella is right here in the name Stella? So that's probably where the name Stella the star came from, the fact that this is a constellation. So that was actually very clever of Siri or whoever wrote this story. Now let's get started with the story. Up above in outer space, among all the stars watching over us, there was a lonely little star named Stella. Let's talk about among because this is a great preposition. Among means part of a group. So we have Stella, one star among all the stars. So you can understand the meaning here. One star, part of the group of stars. That's the easier way to use among. We do use this in more advanced ways, which you can feel comfortable with. There was a lot of celebrating among the students. So this is a more advanced way of saying the students were celebrating. The students were celebrating. Not only is it slightly more advanced, but it also changes the focus because notice here, the sentence started, starts with, there was a lot of celebrating. So in this case, it focuses more on the celebrating, the event or the activity or the emotion. And then this is telling you who, and it's the group of students. There was a lot of celebrating among the students. The students were celebrating. There was a lot of confusion among the students. The students were confused. Again, it just focuses on the confusion more. So that's a more advanced way that you can use the preposition among. No one had ever made a wish upon her. Her, of course, being Stella. Remember, Stella's a star. And in North America culture, at least, you can let me know if this is the same in your culture. It probably is, but maybe it's not. So let me know. It's very common to look up at the stars and make a wish on a star. So that's something that we do, especially as children. You'll look up, you'll find a star, and you'll wish upon it. You wish upon the star. Let's talk about upon. This is a more formal way of saying on, but we use it in very specific situations. We use it in a more poetic sense, and that's why it's being used in this poem, this short story. You could say wish on a star and that would be correct. Or you could say wish upon a star and that's correct. It sounds more formal and it sounds more poetic. So in most cases for you, for everyday use, use on, because I wouldn't say I have a meeting upon Monday. That sounds awkward. You would say I have a meeting on Monday. But there is one time that we commonly use upon, and that is to mean as or shortly after something happened. For example, upon talking to the students, I realized there was a lot of confusion among them. 
Now, I didn't have to say among them. I could have just ended. I realized there was a lot of confusion because it's obvious the confusion belongs to the students because that's the only subject I have here. But you can use among them and then you're practicing what we've already learned. So here in this case, upon represents as I talked to the students or after I talked to the students. And I'll add shortly after, shortly after I talked to the students. But notice here, upon talking, you need that verb in ing because upon is a preposition. Here, if you said as I, as I talked, because you have a subject, so you're just going to conjugate your verb. As I talked, shortly after I talked to the students. So this is one area where you can use upon, and it does sound natural, but it sounds slightly more, more formal, I would say. Let's continue. No one had ever made a wish upon her. Oh, poor Stella. In fact, no one on earth had even looked at Stella because she was so small and far away. Let's talk about in fact, because adding transition words to your vocabulary can really help you sound more advanced. In fact, this is only used to emphasize what was previously said. So previously, the story said no one had ever made a wish upon her. Okay, so now I'm going to emphasize this and make it even stronger by saying no one had even looked at her. So it makes it even stronger. The fact that Stella, the star, is neglected or lonely is emphasized. In fact, in fact, as a transition where you could remove it and the sentence would still be grammatically correct. No one on earth had even looked at Stella, but it just is there to show emphasis because she was so small and far away. Compared to the other stars sparkling in the sky. So notice this preposition compared to. So compared to the other stars, Stella was barely a speck. So we're comparing Stella to the other stars. Compared to learning Japanese, learning English is easier or harder. I have no idea because I haven't learned English. It's my native language <laughs> and I haven't learned Japanese either. You can let me know which one's easier or harder. So that's how you could use that structure. Stella was barely a speck. So let's talk about a speck. When you describe something as a speck, it means extremely, extremely small. So you could say, oh, you have a speck of dirt on your shirt. So I know it's just a tiny amount of dirt on my shirt. So I might not be too concerned if it's just a speck because it's very, very small. Here's another example. The painters left specks of paint, very, very small amounts of paint all over the floor. So you might not even notice them unless you're looking directly at them. So, but notice here, this is the noun paint and then speck describes the paint and is plural because there's more than one specks of paint. But in this case, it's describing Stella as a speck, barely a speck. Barely here makes it even sound smaller because barely represents not even, not even a speck, barely a speck. But Stella had just as much luck to give as any other star. Because remember, we wish upon stars because we consider them to be lucky. Let's talk about luck and lucky because they're both commonly used. You can say, oh, you're so lucky. You won the prize. When you're lucky, it means good things happen to you, but by chance, there's nothing you did to win the prize. It was completely random 
by chance. You're so lucky. You could also say you have the best luck. When someone has the best luck, it means they're lucky. So they basically mean the same thing, but this is the adjective form to be lucky. And this is the noun form and you have luck. You have great luck. You have bad luck, which means you're unlucky. If you tell someone, oh, you have bad luck. It means you're unlucky. I'll write that for you. You have the worst luck, which means you're unlucky. So bad things happen to you, but there's nothing you did to attract those bad things. It was random. It was by chance. Hopefully you don't think that at all. You're so lucky. That's the one you want to remember. Let's continue. Being there for someone is what gives stars their inner glow. So notice here, being there for someone, this is a gerund sentence. We're starting the sentence with a gerund verb. Now, all of this in the gerund sentence, all of this part, being there for someone, this is technically the subject of the sentence and the verb is conjugated with all of this and it, all of this as the gerund is conjugated as it or this. So that's why you need your third person singular. This is what gives stars their inner glow, being there for someone. That's the subject. And we use gerund expressions when you're making a general statement that applies in most situations, most of the time. She wished she could be the brightest, like Sirius. Now, Sirius is a constellation. Do you remember what a constellation is? A constellation is a group of stars that has a name and generally you can make some sort of shape out of them. So to be honest, I don't know what the constellation Sirius is. I don't know what shape it forms. If you do, please share in the comments because it probably has a shape and I'm not sure what that is. So she wished she could be the brightest like Sirius. So I guess Sirius is the brightest star or perhaps Sirius is a constellation or maybe Sirius is just one individual star. That's actually possible too. So maybe Sirius isn't a constellation. It's just one star. So let me know in the comments, is Sirius a constellation or just one single star? Okay. You can share that with me. She wished she could be the brightest like Sirius whom people always turn to for advice. So notice here, when you turn to someone for advice, it means you, you seek advice from that person. So let's say I always turn to my father for advice. It means whenever I need advice, I call my dad and I say, Hey dad, what should I do? I turn to my dad for advice. I wrote that here for you. I always turn to my dad for advice. Now you can also turn to someone for specific advice. When it comes to learning English, I hope you turn to me for advice. You come to me, but specifically advice for learning English. So if you do put this in the comments, Jennifer, I turn to you. I turn to you, which means you seek advice from me specific to learning English. Clearly I can't give you advice about the stars or constellations because I don't even know what Sirius is. So maybe I turn to you for other advice as well. <laughs> okay. So that is to turn to someone for advice. And remember, turn to you for advice if you included the word advice. Now let's talk about whom I know this confuses students a lot, but also just know it confuses native speakers. Native speakers generally replace whom with who, because they're not overly confident with using whom. So you'll, you will hear that a lot from native speakers. If you're wondering why it's just because we're more confident using who. You need to use whom when it's the object of the sentence, who is the subject and whom is the object. So in this sentence, she wished she could be the brightest like Sirius 
whom people always turn to for advice. So this sentence is saying people always turn to serious for advice. I'll write that for you. So here you can see that people, that's the subject and serious is the object receiving the action. And that's why we use whom here. Outside of a formal language exam, just use who. It's totally fine. Native speakers use it as well. But if you are taking a formal language exam, you should know the difference between the two. Let's continue. Or in an important spot like Polaris. So she's still wishing. Stella is wishing she could be in an important spot like Polaris the North Star. Okay, so now I know Polaris, that's the North Star. So it's not a constellation, it's just one star. And that star is in an important spot, the North Star. Ah, uh, again, whom? Because Polaris is not doing the action, Polaris is receiving the action. Whom people looked to for direction. You could also say turn to, for direction because people are seeking the direction from Polaris. So you could use turn to as well. Now I wrote the same thing here. Whom is the object? And the same difference applies. People look to Polaris for direction. People, subject, Polaris, object, which represents whom in the way that this is written. Sometimes Stella even wished she could be the star that the world revolved around. Ah, which star does the world revolve around? I know this one even before I read it. The sun. <laughs> the sun is the star that the world revolves around. Then everyone could see her. Let's continue. Stella wished and wished and wished these things, but her wishes never worked. You could also say never came true because that's what we commonly use for a wish. Her wishes never came because that's the past simple of come. Her wishes never came true. I wish something, but it didn't come true. I wish something, but it didn't work. Although they use work in the story, it is more common to use come true specific with wish. For example, I hope all your wishes come true. I wrote this here for you. And you could also say, I hope all your dreams come true. Same thing. I wouldn't say, I hope all your dreams work. All your wishes come true, your dreams come true. So I personally prefer that instead of work, but obviously I understand what that means. In fact, we already know what this is used for. It's used to emphasize. So the next sentence without me reading it, I know is going to emphasize something about her wishes not coming true. So let's read this. In fact, the more Stella wished, the more unlucky she felt. So remember, if someone is unlucky, you can say that person has what? She has bad luck. Luck is the noun and the verb is have, and we have to conjugate it with our subject. The more unlucky she felt, the more bad luck she had written another way. Then, one night, Stella got an idea. Got an idea is very common in American English. You could also say had an idea. It's also very common in American English. So you could use either one. Got an idea, had an idea. What if she wished upon a person? Now remember, this is a star. So generally people wish upon stars because we want our dreams to come true. So now the story is saying this star is going to wish upon a person. That's pretty cute, isn't it? What if she wished upon a person? After all, stars and people are made of the same stuff. Stuff is another way of saying things. Things. 
So you can say, oh, I have a lot of stuff to do today. I have a lot of things to do today. But do you notice a difference between them? I wrote it here so it would be easier to see the difference. Stuff is considered uncountable, so we don't add an S to it. Whereas things is countable, so you add an S to it. So stuff represents many different things, but it is uncountable. So don't make that mistake. But both of them are very commonly used. Oh, another in fact. So what are we going to emphasize now? Stars and people are made of the same stuff. So now something is going, the next sentence is going to emphasize this. In fact, some people were rock stars and film stars. Oh, that's cute. Because Stella the star is saying, oh, this person is just like me because they're called a rock star or a film star because some people have the title star in their name. We call celebrities stars, right? Oh, she's a film star, a celebrity, and a rock star is a musician. So a rock star is a musician, but we also have a common expression in English. You're a rock star. I say this a lot in the comment section. So maybe I've replied to one of your comments and I said, you're a rock star. This means you're amazing. You're amazing. You're a rock star. It can also mean you're doing a great job as well. You're doing a great job. So if you did a lot of stuff at work, a lot of different things, and your boss sees how much you've accomplished, your boss could say, you're a rock star. You're doing a great job, but also that means you're amazing. So I want you to put in the comments, we're all rock stars. We're all rock stars because we are. You're a rock star. I'm a rock star. We're all rock stars. We're all amazing. Put it in the comments. Let's spread some positivity. That's what Stella's doing with this story, spreading positivity. So let's do the same and put we're all rock stars in the comments. So some people were rock stars and film stars, surely they would be able to help her because remember, they're made of the same stuff. They're both stars. This is such a cute story. But as Stella looked down at all the billions of people on earth, she realized that maybe there were people out there just like her. Finally, Stella knew what to do. Just one thing here, all the billions of people, you can say all the billions or all of the billions. Both of them are grammatically correct. It is more common to leave out the of and just say all the billions of people instead of all of the billions of people. When we're talking in more of a general sense, you can use of. But when you're talking about a more specific group, so for example, the people on earth, then you can just get rid of of. So ultimately, either one is correct. Let's continue our last paragraph. Now, every night, Stella wishes upon anyone who feels small and unseen. Unseen, this is another word for invisible invisible. A lot of people in this world feel like they're invisible. So Stella is going to wish upon you and remind you that you're not, that you are a rock star. So remember, Stella's wishing on you because she feels small and unseen. So she wants to wish upon someone who feels the same, who feels small and unseen, invisible, hoping they'll look up and find her and feel the inner glow of knowing that they're not alone. So the inner glow of knowing, if you feel like you're not alone, that will make you feel warm on the inside. And sometimes when someone is very happy or positive, we say, oh wow, they're glowing. We describe someone who looks extremely happy. For example, a bride on her wedding day, as a compliment, someone would say, you're glowing, you're glowing, which is another way of just saying, you look so happy. And 
that is what Stella is hoping will happen for people when she wishes upon them. And that's the end of the story. It's hard to really hear the whole story when we stop every sentence to review the grammar. So what I'll do now is I'll read the story from start to finish now that you understand the individual words and you can focus on my pronunciation, but you can also focus on the story because it truly is a very heartwarming story. Before I read that, let me teach you one last thing. I chose this story because I thought it was very heartwarming. Heartwarming is an adjective. It's just formed from the word heart and the word warming, but we say them together. That was a heartwarming story. You could also say that was a touching story. Both of these are adjectives and they mean the same thing. When a story is heartwarming or touching, it means it's a positive story and it makes you feel good. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. So now I'll read the story from start to finish. Stella the Star by Siri. Up above in outer space, among all the stars watching over us, there was a lonely little star named Stella. No one had ever made a wish upon her. In fact, no one on earth had even looked at Stella because she was so small and far away. Compared to the other stars sparkling in the sky, Stella was barely a speck. But Stella had just as much luck to give as any other star. Being there for someone is what gives stars their inner glow. She wished she could be the brightest, like Sirius, whom people always turn to for advice. Or in an important spot like Polaris, the North Star, who people look to for direction. Sometimes Stella even wished she could be the star that the world revolved around, the sun. Then everyone could see her. Stella wished and wished and wished these things, but her wishes never worked. In fact, the more Stella wished, the more unlucky she felt. Then, one night, Stella got an idea. What if she wished upon a person? After all, stars and people are made of the same stuff. In fact, some people were rock stars and film stars. Surely they would be able to help her. But as Stella looked down at all the billions of people on earth, she realized that maybe there were people out there just like her. Finally, Stella knew what to do. Now, every night, Stella wishes upon anyone who feels small and unseen, hoping they'll look up and find her and feel the inner glow of knowing that they're not alone. You are doing such a great job. Are you ready for an upper intermediate B2 short story? Let's review it together right now. First, I'll read the headline. Japanese firm unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. So in this picture here, you can see the vertical pod. So pod is the name for this unit. And then vertical is the fact that it's upright. So vertical and then horizontal is across. So it's not a horizontal pod, like your bed is horizontal. This is a vertical pod and it lets you nap upright. So just like I said, horizontal, you would be sleeping in your bed. You would not be upright. You would be lying down. So in this case, for napping, for sleeping, the opposite of upright would be lying down because that's how we normally sleep. Except if you're in Japan using one of these vertical pods, you'll be napping upright just like this woman in the photo. So what do you think? Before we even read this article, do you think you could nap in this pod upright? Share your thoughts, yes or no, put that in the comments. Certainly an interesting concept. I wrote that information for you and I also wrote the definition of nap. I think it should be well known, but a nap is of course a short sleep, usually during the day. Now in this Example, nap is a verb, which of course you can do to nap, just like to sleep. So I could ask you, oh, do you nap? Do you nap? I'm asking you, do you sleep for a short period of time during the day? Do you nap? 
Now, it's very common to use nap as a noun. If you use nap as a noun, you have two choices of verbs and it does not matter which one you use. Both are very common and natural. Do you take naps? Do you have naps? So you can use either one equally. So what about you? Do you nap? Do you take naps? Do you have naps? Share that in the comments as well. Now, maybe you'll start taking more naps if you had this vertical pod. Now, don't worry about writing all these notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF, so you can look for the link in the description. Before we continue with the article, I also wrote the definition for unveil. This is a verb, to unveil. When you unveil something, you show it for the first time or you introduce it for the first time. So when this vertical pod was unveiled, it means the public, you and I, were able to see it for the first time. So the Japanese firm, firm is another word for company. Japanese firm, Japanese company, unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. All right, let's find out more about this. It's interesting that it's also in a public place. I don't know if I could nap in a public place with people just walking around. Interesting concept though, let's find out. Experts have long argued that having a power nap at work. Okay, let's look at this because you could say experts have argued that having a power nap at work and then whatever it is, we'll get to that in a second. But notice how they added have long argued. This is another way of saying experts have argued for a long time. So instead of saying for a long time, experts have argued for a long time. You can simply take the word long and use it before the verb. Experts have long argued. So maybe you could say, I have long said that improving your English is important for your career. So I've said for a long time. So I haven't just said this once or twice. I've long said, experts have long argued that having a power nap. Let's take a look at power nap. A power nap is a nap, but when I hear a power nap, I picture a nap that is for a short period of time. So you're really this just there to have a very short nap for the sole purpose of waking up and being able to perform better. Whereas you could have a nap on a Sunday afternoon just for the purpose of relaxing and pure enjoyment, but a power nap, you just want to have a very short nap so you can wake up and be more energized, more productive, work better, work smarter. Have you ever had a power nap? Do you think the idea of power naps is a good idea or a bad idea? Share that in the comments as well. Okay, have long argued that having a power nap can at work, so not on a Sunday afternoon at home on the couch, at work can increase alertness. Alertness, this is your adjective, an adjective to just say that you are very awake. Your alertness is you're very, you're very awake. So you should never drive if you're not alert because if you're not very awake, that can be very dangerous. So your, your amount of mentally being very awake. Alertness, boost productivity. Boost is a very common way of saying increase, increase. We use this a lot especially in a business context. For example, we need to boost our sales. We need to increase our sales. I wrote that example here for you. Now, of course, boost is a verb, so you have to conjugate it. In this example, that nap, this should say nap, not help, that nap really boosted my alertness. Okay, so here, 
Boost is in the past simple because it's a completed past action. That nap really boosted my alertness. Now, previously, I think I said alertness is an adjective. If I said that it is not, that's incorrect. <laughs> alertness is the noun form, is speaking about alert, being alert. Alert is the adjective and alertness is the noun form. So it's just speaking about it as a thing, as a concept. So my alertness, because we often have articles or possessives before nouns. So alertness is a noun. I put it here for you. And alert is an adjective. I'm sorry if previously I said the wrong thing. Now, again, your alertness is your feeling of being awake, and we often talk about it with mentally awake. So you could also say that nap helped me become more alert. So in this case, alert is our adjective. I am alert. I feel alert. I've become more alert. That nap helped me become more alert. So this is what the article or the company who created this vertical pod for upright napping is suggesting as the importance of having naps. Let's continue. Boost productivity and even make you more creative. Now, a Japanese firm, remember firm company, has revealed. Before, do you remember the verb that they used in the headline? It was unveiled, unveiled. When you reveal something, you also introduce it or make it known, show it for the first time. So in this context, is exactly the same. Has unveiled, has revealed. Now they've revealed a bizarre pod. By using the adjective bizarre, they're saying it's strange, strange, bizarre, unusual. And it is, right? The fact that it's an upright and you nap upright instead of lying down, so you're in a vertical position rather than a horizontal position, that is bizarre. Most people don't sleep like that. At least in North America, we don't. If you're in Japan, you can let us know, is this a common practice in Japan? Have you ever seen this pod in Japan? So if you're watching from Japan or you've been to Japan, please share your thoughts on this as well. So that's what they mean by bizarre as an adjective. So we can say strange or unusual, strange, unusual. Bizarre pod that makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut eye. So to grab some shut eye, well, right now I'm closing my eyes, but you can also say I'm shutting my eyes. It's not very common to say shut your eyes, but you can say that. It's more common to say close your eyes, close your eyes. But this is where the expression shut eye comes from, shut eye. So if you want to grab some shut eye, it's another way of saying grab some sleep, sleep, okay? And remember, a nap is just a short sleep, usually during the day. And American English speakers, we commonly replace the verb get with grab. It's very common for us to do this. It's more informal, it's more casual, but it's very frequently done. It would be very common for an American to text a friend or call a friend or just say to a friend, a coworker, anyone, hey, do you want to grab a coffee? Do you want to grab a coffee after work? Extremely common. I use it all the time myself. And it's just a replacement to, do you want to get a coffee? Which I guess is also a replacement to, do you want to have a coffee after work? But very common to use grab. You don't have to use it if you're not comfortable with it because it does depend on the specific context if it's appropriate or not. But it is important that you understand 
what it means in the context, even if you choose not to use it, you don't want to use it yourself, that's fine. You can just use get or have. But again, important to understand this is how native speakers speak in the real world. So for it makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut eye, get some sleep. Giraffe nap. So this is the name of the pod, giraffe nap. Giraffe nap is a vertical pod that lets office employees sleep upright, upright. So again, very interesting. Of course, they're not targeting this for your home because why would you get this in your home? You have your couch, you have your bed. That's where you would have a nap, right? But this is for the office. So they're targeting office employees. So it lets office employees sleep upright, much like the long necked mammal. The long necked mammal, of course, they're talking about a giraffe and that's where the name came from because a giraffe sleeps upright. Many animals sleep upright, not really a trait of humans, but many animals sleep upright. About the size as a small public phone booth, it contains a series of platforms. So notice here the sentence structure because we're not starting with a subject. This is just additional information about the pod, but the sentence really starts here because this is our subject, it. Otherwise, you would say it is about the size as a small public phone booth, period. It contains, and then you can continue on, it contains a series of platforms. This would be a separate sentence. This alone cannot be a separate sentence because there is no subject. But you can turn it into a separate sentence by having your subject. And then if you have a subject, you of course need a verb. And then the rest of the sentence, which describes the subject. It is about the size as a small public phone booth it contains. But here, this is just additional information about the size. So this is a more casual way of saying approximately about. I slept for about 20 minutes, approximately 20 minutes. You could also say around 20 minutes. All three of those are very commonly used. Approximately is the most formal and then around about are more casual ways of saying it. It contains a series of platforms that support body weight while blocking out noise from the outside. Okay, if you block something out, you're blocking out noise, it means you're preventing it from, from entering. We specifically use the phrasal verb to block out with light and noise. So in this case, it's noise. So if you're in this public place, you don't have to worry about wearing earplugs because the pod itself is soundproof. It blocks out the noise. But I wonder if it blocks out the light because the room is very light and when you're napping, it's probably easier if it's dark. But it looks like it does have a cover and maybe when you close the cover, it becomes completely dark as well. So it could also block out the light. Otherwise, you might want to wear an eye mask to block out the light. And I wrote that example here. This eye mask really blocks out the light. Let's continue. However, at just 8.4 feet high and four feet wide, claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. Okay, claustrophobes. The more common expression is claustrophobics. Listen to the pronunciation, claustrophobic, claustrophobic. And then you add an S to it to mean all claustrophobic people, claustrophobics, claustrophobics. People who are claustrophobic and then 
if you just say claustrophobics, it means people who are claustrophobic. So claustrophobics don't like small spaces. It makes them very uncomfortable. So maybe even being in an elevator would be uncomfortable because it's a small enclosed space. And of course, our vertical pod is a small enclosed space, especially if you put the cover over it to block out the light, it would feel even more enclosed. So if you're claustrophobic, you wouldn't like this. Claustrophobes, claustrophobics wouldn't like this. Claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. If you opt for something, it means you choose that as an option. So let's say you're going mattress shopping and there are so many different types of mattresses to choose from. You could say we opted for a firm mattress to mean that you chose a firm mattress and there were many, many other options. Now to use this expression, there could just be two options, firm and soft, and you opted for the firm mattress. You, we use the preposition for if it's followed by a noun. If it's a verb, then you just use the infinitive. We opted to buy a firm mattress. And opt is a verb, so you need to conjugate it, and that's why it's in the past simple with the ed. We opted to buy a firm mattress, which is just another way of saying we chose to buy a firm mattress. So claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. So they have the vertical pod, which might make them feel claustrophobic, or they have the office sofa. So if they opt for it, they choose the office sofa and they don't choose the vertical pod. What about you? Which one would you opt for? Would you opt for the pod or the sofa? I think I would personally give the pod a try. I'm not claustrophobic, so that wouldn't bother me at all. And it looks interesting. I would definitely like to try a power nap in the pod, the giraffe pod. Okay, let's continue. The firm said it's working towards a society where everyone can easily take a nap. So remember here we have our verb take a nap, but you can also use which verb? Have. You can also use have a nap, or you could also just say where everyone can easily nap. And you can just use nap as a verb. So instead of take a nap, have a nap, you can just say easily nap. So I'll put this one under here. Can easily nap, can easily have a nap, can easily take a nap. And ultimately improve business and healthcare. So the company believes in naps. They they think that they're very beneficial, so they want everyone in society to regularly have naps. Do you think that would be a good idea? Feel free to share. There are probably many people who have been unable to get rid of their physical fatigue. Fatigue is another way of saying tiredness, sleepiness, that feeling of being tired, but fatigue, it sounds stronger. It affects your whole health, fatigue. So I wrote extreme tiredness for fatigue. And to get rid of, this is another way of saying to eliminate, to permanently remove, to get rid of, to get rid of their physical fatigue and stress and have endured sleepiness and continued to work the firm says. The verb endure simply means to experience, but we only use it for difficult negative things. So I wouldn't say, oh, I endured a beautiful day at the park. It, because a beautiful day at the park is not a difficult thing. I endured a night of terrible sleep. So I experienced it, but I experienced it in a very negative way. I endured a night of difficult, restless sleep. So now I'm fatigued. I'm extremely tired. So have endured sleepiness and continue to work, the firm says. Now we are approaching an era where we're breaking down such stereotypes. 
So if you break down a stereotype, it means you try to eliminate it. So you could use the get rid of. We're trying to get rid of, eliminate such stereotypes. Eliminate, and I'll write down, get rid of. And the stereotype, although they don't specifically say it here, I guess the stereotype would be that it's normal to be fatigued and continue to work. So it's normal to, to just go through your eight hours, even though you're very tired, rather than have a nap, a power nap, and try to boost your alertness, your productivity, your creativity. I think that's the stereotype. Because I don't know about in your country or your part of the world, but in North America, I would say naps aren't really something that most adults do. And I guess it's probably viewed more as, as like, why do you need a nap? You shouldn't take a nap. You should just work through it. You need to work through the day. That's more the attitude. I would say in North America, naps are generally for children and the elderly, but not really adults and certainly not in the middle of the day at work. It, it's, it's not a common practice. It's certainly not viewed as a positive thing. So that's probably the stereotype. What about in, in your country, in your part of the world is are naps viewed more positively as being productive? Is it appropriate for an adult to have a nap in the middle of the day at work? So share that because I would be really interested to know because in North America, I would say currently I, it, it isn't a common practice. It wouldn't be viewed very positively. And I think that's the stereotype they're trying to break down, eliminate, get rid of. Let's continue. The company recommends a nap time of 20 minutes. So a nap time of 20 minutes, that's the total length of the nap. I'm laughing a little because when you say, oh, it's nap time, this is what we say to children. And remember I said, oh, in North America, it's not common for adults to have a nap. I have only ever heard of nap time in the context of a child. Oh, it's nap time. Oh, it's my kid's nap time. Sorry, I can't, I can't grab a coffee. It's my kid's nap time. But in this context, that's not how they're using it. They're just saying a nap duration of 20 minutes. It's just funny seeing nap time because as I said, that's what parents use with their children. So a nap duration of 20 minutes. As anything longer than 30 minutes can affect your sleep at night. So again, that's the concept of a power nap, a power nap. There's really that emphasis on the nap not being very long and the sole purpose of it is so you can wake up more alert, more productive, more creative, not because you want to have this relaxing, enjoyable, lazy sleep on the couch on a Sunday afternoon. That's not the purpose. So a power nap. And that's the end of our article. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about naps and how your culture, your society, your country views naps in general, because I shared at least how it's viewed in North America. And now what I'll do is I'll read the article from start to finish, and this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Japanese firm unveils a vertical pod that lets you nap upright. Experts have long argued that having a power nap at work can increase alertness, boost productivity, and even make you more creative. Now, a Japanese firm has revealed a bizarre pod that makes it easier than ever before for workers to grab some shut eye. Giraffe nap is a vertical pod that lets office employees sleep upright, much like the long neck mammal. About the size as a small public phone booth, it contains a series of platforms that support body weight while blocking out noise from the outside. 
However, at just 8.4 feet high and 4 feet wide, claustrophobes might want to opt for the office sofa. The firm said it is working towards a society where everyone can easily take a nap and ultimately improve business and health care. There are probably many people who have been unable to get rid of their physical fatigue and stress and have endured sleepiness and continue to work, the firm says. Now we are approaching an era where we're breaking down such stereotypes. The company recommends a nap time of 20 minutes as anything longer than 30 minutes can affect your sleep at night. You're doing so great. Our last story is the most advanced C1. Let's review it together. Our headline, nice and short, life on Mars, a very interesting topic. A new study published in the journal Science shows definitive evidence of organic matter on the surface of Mars. Organic matter simply means living matter, matter that is living. For example, in this picture, it looks like there's some green. When you see green, you think plants. So it looks like living matter, organic matter. Now let's take a look at this. Shows evidence shows definitive evidence. When I see this, I say, wow, definitive evidence. Definitive is an adjective that means firm, final, or complete. So this evidence is firm. It's final. You can think of it as not to be questioned. So you can't question this evidence. It's firm and final. So real evidence, it makes it a lot stronger of organic matter on the surface of Mars. Now notice here, we have the journal Science, and you see that Science has a capital S. This is because it's a proper noun, and you need to capitalize the first letter of a proper noun. Proper noun, and it's a proper noun because the name of the journal is Science. That's why it has a capital S. But if you were just talking about the subject, Science, I love science class, you don't need to capitalize it because in this case, it's not a proper noun. The data was collected by NASA's nuclear-powered rover Curiosity. Again, this is a great example. Curiosity, which you probably know as a noun, curiosity is a good thing when you're a student, but in this case, it's the name of the rover. The name of the rover is Curiosity, and that's why we have a capital first letter. It's a proper noun. It confirms... The rover, Curiosity, confirms earlier findings that the red planet once contained carbon-based compounds. I'll be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what a carbon-based compound is. It's a compound that contains carbon. That's all I know about that. Red planet is another name for the planet Mars because it is red. So when you see red planet, you know they're talking about Mars. These compounds, they're talking about the carbon-based compounds, also called organic molecules, are essential ingredients for life as scientists understand it. Now notice how they explain what these compounds are or why they're important, because the average person like me, who doesn't have a scientific background, has no idea what a carbon-based compound is. So they explain what this is. So now I know, okay, essential, meaning very important, extremely important, important, and not just important, very important essential ingredients for life as scientists understand it. So now I know you can't have life without these carbon-based compounds and they have found definitive evidence that these compounds exist on Mars, the red planet, essentially saying that life on Mars is possible. The organic molecules were found in Mars's Gale Crater a large area that may have been a watery lake over 3 billion years ago. The rover encountered traces of the molecule in rocks extracted from the area. When you extract something, it means you remove it 
or take it out. So they have a rock and within this rock, there are molecules. So they took those molecules out. They extracted it. This is also the terminology you use. If you need to get a tooth removed, you can extract a tooth, which means simply to remove it. So to remove or take out to remove or take out and you remove something generally from something else. So you extract the molecules from the rock. The rocks also contain sulfur, which scientists speculate helped preserve the organics. Even when the rocks were exposed to the harsh radiation on the surface of the planet. Remember, we're talking about the planet Mars. Now let's take a look at this verb speculate, a very common verb. When you speculate on something, it means you essentially guess what the answer is. And you do that because you don't have enough information to be certain. If you're certain, it means you 100% know. So you can present that information as a fact. But if you're just guessing, you use the verb speculate. So when your audience hears speculate, they know that you are not 100% certain. You are in fact guessing. So scientists speculate. So they don't actually know that this is 100% correct. It's their best guess based on the information they have. Scientists speculate helped preserve the organics, even when the rocks were exposed to the harsh radiation. Let's take a look at harsh. Harsh is an adjective. So I could say exposed to the radiation, which means the radiation affected it. It was in the same area as the radiation. So it was exposed to the ra radiation to the harsh radiation. So harsh is an adjective that modifies radiation and harsh means unpleasant, unkind, cruel, or more severe than necessary. So radiation is very strong. And they're saying that this radiation was very severe, perhaps more severe than it usually is. The harsh radiation on the surface of the planet. Let's move on. Scientists are quick to state that the presence of these organic molecules is not sufficient evidence for ancient life on Mars, as the molecules could have been formed by non-living processes. So here they're casting some doubt. Ancient life on Mars? So they're saying right now we don't have enough evidence to say that previously in ancient times there was life on Mars. So that would be ancient life. So not sufficient is saying we don't have enough evidence, not sufficient. So not enough, not enough to be convincing, not enough. And in this case to convince, you could say, I don't have sufficient time. So in that case, it's not enough time to do something. I don't have sufficient time to complete this article. I don't have enough time to do it. So the scientists are suggesting there could be another reason why these mo molecules are there. But it's still one of the most astonishing discoveries, which could lead to future revelations. Let's take a look at astonishing as an adjective. This means surprising, or it can be amazing. That was astonishing. That was amazing. But maybe it was, oh, that was astonishing. It was surprising at the same time. So it depends on how it's being used. In this case, it could be really either the most astonishing discoveries, which could lead to future revelations. Let's look at revelation 
In this case, it's a noun. It comes from the verb reveal. So when you reveal something, you make that information known. It's the same case as a revelation. A revelation is when a fact becomes known. Now, it can be when a unknown fact becomes known. So before we didn't know it, and now we know it. It's a revelation. Or it can be when a secret fact becomes known. So certain people knew it, but the general public did it not. So when the general public found out, oh, what a revelation. Remember, this comes from the verb to reveal. And you reveal a secret, which means you share a secret that you previously had not shared. Especially when one considers the other startling find that curiosity uncovered around five years ago. Remember, curiosity is the name of NASA's rover, which is the machine that operates on the surface of the planet Mars. Now let's look at startling as an adjective, a startling find. When something is startling, it's surprising but usually in a worrisome way. So you could say, I went to the doctor and I got some startling news. That doesn't sound very good because it's news that surprised you, but generally in a negative way, in a worrisome way. So especially when one considers the other startling find that curiosity uncovered around five years ago. So we'll find out what that startling find is, that surprising find, but somehow in some sort of a negative way, perhaps a worrisome way. The rover analyzes the air around it periodically. Periodically is an adverb that means from time to time, periodically, from time to time. So consistently means all the time, but periodically means perhaps once a week or once a day. So on a schedule, but not all the time, which would be consistently. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers on TV, movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English and learn advanced phrasal verbs, idioms, expressions, and vocabulary, and grammar, and pronunciation, all in a very natural, fun, engaging way. And you'll have me as your personal coach, so you can look in the description description or the comment section for more information on how to join. Now let's continue on. And in 2014, it, Rover, it found the air contained another of the most basic organic molecules and a key ingredient of natural gas, methane. So the Rover found another molecule on the planet Mars, methane. One of the characteristics of methane is that it only survives a few hundred years. So a few hundred, to me, that sounds like 300, maybe 400, maybe 500, because a few is more than two, because two is a couple. A couple hundred years is two, and few is generally more than two, but less than, definitely less than 10, three to five, I would say, a few hundred years. This means that something somewhere on Mars is replenishing the supply. When something is replenished, it means it's filled up again. So for example, if a lake had water and then there was a drought, very dry conditions and all the water evaporated. So if you put more water in that lake, you're replenishing the lake. You're filling the lake again. So they're saying that something on the planet Mars is replenishing the supply of methane, 
which could be the startling find. It's surprising, and maybe there's reason to be concerned. What is this that's replenishing the supply? How is it doing this? What does it mean for us on Earth? That could be the startling part. According to NASA, Mars emits thousands of tons of methane at a time. The verb emit simply means to, to produce or to send out, to produce or send out. But we use this in very specific cases. We use it with gases. In this case, we also use this with sounds, sounds. So the, the truck emits a lot of gas for one and a lot of noise. Oh, the sound that that truck is emitting or the building is emitting. It's really hurting my ears. We also use this for light. So the airport emits a lot of light. It's blinding. Mars emits thousands of tons of methane at a time. The level of methane rises and falls as seasonal intervals in the year, almost as if the planet is breathing it. Sounds a little strange. Perhaps that's the startling information here. NASA suspects the methane comes from deep under the surface of the planet, the variations in temperature on the surface of Mars cause the molecule, which is methane, to flow upwards at higher or lower levels. Okay, so this is the scientists are speculating because if you suspect something, you don't know for sure. Otherwise, you would say NASA knows the methane comes, but they suspect, which means they're about 80% sure they're guessing. So again, you could also use the verb speculate. NASA speculates the methane comes from deep under the surface. So they don't know 100%. For example, in the winter, the gas could get trapped in underground icy crystals. Okay, so this is what's happening to the methane. These crystals, called clathrates, melt in the summer and release the gas. So this is their theory on how this gas is being released at different times of the year. In winter, it's frozen. The gas is frozen in these icy crystals. But in summer, when these crystals melt, they release the methane. Again, this is not a fact because they're speculating. They suspect this is what is happening. They don't know it to be true. However, the source of the methane is still a complete mystery. Complete is an adjective and it means very great or the highest possible. So we're saying it's a mystery, but not just a mystery. Imagine the greatest mystery you've ever thought of. That's a complete mystery. It's a very great mystery. The highest mystery possible. It's a complete mystery. So the source, meaning how the methane is there originally. Where does the methane come from? That is a complete mystery. The world of astrobiology considers both of these studies a historical milestone. A milestone is an important event, and it's an important event in history or in your life as well an important event in history or one's life. For example, one of the big milestones is when you graduate from school. That's a milestone. That's an important event in your life. When you graduate, when you get married, when you get your first job, when you have a baby, you buy your first car, buy your first house. These are all milestones. But of course, there are also historical milestones. And this 
the information found in these studies is one of those milestones. According to this information, Mars is not a dead planet. So of course, a dead planet would be a planet that cannot sustain life. On the contrary, we use this as a transition word when we want to introduce a contrasting point. So dead planet is the one point. Now the contrasting point would have to show something with life and we can use on the contrary. Mars is not a dead planet. On the contrary, it is quite active with life, with molecules, with organic matter and may be changing and becoming more habitable. If you describe something as habitable, it means you're able to live there because the conditions are appropriate. So able to live there. For example, a very, very old house that has a lot of damage might not be habitable. It's not suitable to live there. You're not able to live there. Or after a flood or natural disaster, maybe your home is no longer habitable. Of course, this means further research is necessary. Scientists say they need to send new equipment to Mars, equipment that can measure the air and soil with more precision. More precision is another way of saying more accuracy. Accuracy. They need to be more accurate. There are already missions underway. Underway means they're in progress now. In progress now. In progress now. The European Space Agency's ExoMars ship lands in 2020 and will be able to drill into the ground on Mars to analyze what it finds. Additionally, NASA is sending another Mars rover in the same year to collect samples of Martian soil and return them to Earth. So Martian, this comes from the word Mars. Just like if you live in Italy, you're an Italian. If you live on Mars, you're a Martian. <laughs> that can be something you can maybe look forward to. So live on Mars equals Martian. Martian soil, Italian wine, pizza, tomatoes, for example, Martian soil. And notice how Mars, Martian, Earth also have that capital first letter because they are proper nouns. Remember, we talked about proper nouns at the beginning. Proper nouns, so you need capital first letter. And here, NASA is in all capitals because we also capitalize acronyms. So each letter stands for something. To be honest, I don't know what NASA stands for. I think the SA is Space Agency National. What's the A? Association? Space Agency? That doesn't sound right. What is the acronym for NASA? Do you know? Put it in the comments because honestly, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure SA is Space Agency, but I don't know what the N and the A stand for because nobody ever says it. Everybody says NASA. Let's continue again. Let me know in the comments. The possibility of life on Mars has fascinated humans for generations. It has been the subject of endless science fiction novels and films. If you describe something as endless, it means again and again and again. So as you know, there are always movies and books about aliens, Martians, life on other planets, right? So again and again and again, non-ending. Again and again, non-ending, endless. Are we alone in the universe? Ooh. Or have there been other life forms within our solar system? If the current missions to the red planet, which again means Mars, Mars, if the current missions to the red planet continue, it looks as if we may discover the answer very soon. 
Wow. Isn't that a interesting way to end an article? So that's our article on Mars. Now I will go back and I'll read the article from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Life on Mars. A new study published in the journal Science shows definitive evidence of organic matter on the surface of Mars. The data was collected by NASA's nuclear-powered rover Curiosity. It confirms earlier findings that the red planet once contained carbon-based compounds. These compounds, also called organic molecules, are essential ingredients for life as scientists understand it. The organic molecules were found in Mars's Gale Cater a large area that may have been a watery lake over 3 billion years ago. The rover encountered traces of the molecule in rocks extracted from the area. The rocks also contain sulfur, which scientists speculate helped preserve the organics even when the rocks were exposed to the harsh radiation on the surface of the planet. Scientists are quick to state that the presence of these organic molecules is not sufficient evidence for ancient life on Mars, as the molecules could have been formed by non-living processes. But it's still one of the most astonishing discoveries, which could lead to future revelations. Especially when one considers the other startling find that Curiosity uncovered around five years ago. The rover analyzes the air around it periodically, and in 2014, it found the air contained another of the most basic organic molecules and a key ingredient of natural gas, methane. One of the characteristics of methane is that it only survives a few hundred years. This means that something somewhere on Mars is replenishing the supply. According to NASA, Mars emits thousands of tons of methane at a time. This level of methane rises and falls at seasonal intervals in the year, almost as if the planet is breathing it. NASA suspects the methane comes from deep under the surface of the planet. The variations in temperature on the surface of Mars cause the molecule to flow upwards at higher and higher levels. For example, in the winter, the gas could get trapped in underground icy crystals. These crystals, called clathrates, melt in the summer and release the gas. However, the source of the methane is still a complete mystery. The world of astrobiology considers both of these studies as historical milestones. According to this information, Mars is not a dead planet. On the contrary, it is quite active and may be changing and becoming more habitable. Of course, this means further research is necessary. Scientists say they need to send new equipment to Mars, equipment that can measure the air and soil with more precision. There are already missions underway. The European Space Agency's ExoMars ship lands in 2020 and will be able to drill into the ground on Mars to analyze what it finds. Additionally, NASA is sending another Mars rover in the same year to collect samples of Martian soil and return them to Earth. The possibility of life on Mars has fascinated humans for generations. It has been the subject of endless science fiction novels and films. Are we alone in the universe or have there been other life forms within our solar system? If the current missions to the red planet continue, it looks as if we may discover the answer very soon. Did you like this lesson? Do you want me to review more short stories? If you do, then put more stories, more stories, more stories in the comments below. And of course, make sure you like this lesson, share it with your friends, and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson.
And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And now let's focus on your listening skills. I have an amazing listening test for you right here.